Do you think the current system of the so-called democracy is going to help us again? That one, that one I don't know. I mean, I would only say that Africa did, there were some African leaders who were trying to find an alternative path. You see, even the Americans, when they fought the British and they got their independence, they were looking for a system which would be superior to the European system of kings and queens. So they invented the checks and balances system where the president and the, 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 the judges and the, and the uh, I think they call it the Senate, they can't become too powerful. They can check each other, checks and balances, to prevent tyranny. Um, well, you could say that, let's say people like Nkrumah, Sekretori and um, Nieri, and some of the early leaders, what they wanted to do was to take the advantages that Western civilization has given the world, which is machines, technology, but not to join it to the Western type of culture, which is very individualistic and rather greedy, actually. Um, every man for himself and, you know, God help the rest. I mean, this type of laissez-faire capitalism. But uh, so what Nkrumah was trying to do and the early leaders was to join technology with what you might call African humanism. A humanism based on the African traditions of being social human beings, of sociality, brothers looking after brothers. Um, I mean, of course, you, if you say this in America, if you say the word communalistic Africa, that to them means communism. You see, they've been messed up by their own interpretation. So social means socialism, communal means communi communism, but actually communalism and social behavior is what made us human beings different from apes. As we evolved as human beings, one of the differences, we were able to create language and become social animals. And this is why um, most societies will have, uh, I, how could I, I mean, I, I wouldn't say, well, I would say all societies are based on social principles, uh, uh, which under individualism are threatened I mean, we have now a situation where 1% of this planet controls, is it 50 or 40 or 50% of the whole wealth of the planet? It's owned by 1% of the planet. This is individualism. But they claim this 1% pays um, the biggest tax. No, they're all tax. No, they don't pay taxes. Look, not only because they can bribe, because they have so much money, but if you're a multinational company, you, you do, you're not beholden to any national government because you can move your finances from one country to another. So you've, we've actually, particularly in the, this is my great criticism about capitalism now. I said that there were some positive benefits of capitalism in the early days to develop a nation. But when it gets to monopoly capitalism, or what we call now neoliberalism, this type of modern capitalism, um, you've, got a real, you've got a problem on your hand because, um, how can I put it? Uh, Without trying to become too political. Um, no, you can't say that's the case. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it, it, a monopoly capitalism. In fact, ca capitalism was never meant to evolve into monopoly capitalism. It was the big problem. Because if you amass wealth and concentrate it, you'll end up with monopolies. And monopolies can't compete with each other. So, one of the most beneficial aspects of capitalism, which is competition, disappears. We've now entered that phase, and these big companies that now own the world don't pay taxes. I mean, because they can move their money around. So this is a, a real problem that the world's got. Um, and they're only interested in amassing their, the fortune for themselves and their stockholders or shareholders or whatever. Um, so they plan still, everything is planned on the profit motive. And, but the real, the, the real problem we're, fa we're facing now See, it's not a question of whether you're socialistic or capitalistic, or you want everybody to be equal or unequal. It's the fact that we're actually destroying the planet. Sure. That is the real problem that capitalism cannot solve. Or that, uh, yeah, I would put it the capitalism economic system, not looking at it from a point of view of whether it's good or bad, just as a system in itself, is no longer suitable for this era. So what Nkrumah and these guys were doing back then they were trying to create another model of industry because just because the Europeans invented the Industrial Revolution and industry, it doesn't mean you have to follow the European 
mindset sure. as well. Sure. And for many, many years, the Europeans said that to be modernized, you have to follow the European mindset. So if you want all the benefits of European technology or civilization, you have to also follow their culture. And this was, I mean, it's still there, that, that idea, but there have been countries that have proved that this is not so. And one of the best examples is China. You see, the thing about the, the Chinese is like Africans, they were colonized. Sure. And they also had to fight for their independence. But unlike Africans, they had a great leader called Mao Zedong, who was able to unite the whole of China. Imagine if somebody like Nkrumah had united the whole of Africa back then. And so it would have been like George Washington for the Americans. Sure. So the Chinese. And also the Indians had a great leader called Gandhi. So these countries that are coming out of co capitalism, colonialism, uh, you know, having been Euro European colonies, had great leaders. They got their independence and they don't actually, their mindset is not, and also the Japanese. Also, you will find that some of these Far Eastern and Eastern advanced technological people now, they're not basing their culture on that of Europe which is aggressive individualism. That's the best way I can describe the European culture. Aggressive individualism. Everything is competition. Everything is aggression. Everything is for me and putting the other person down. 